And we are live. We are very happy to to finish our pronunciation week with uh, this speaker that has been so kind and so patient throughout this process. Uh, so we are going to to have uh, Mark Hancock talking about pronunciation teaching going beyond listen and repeat. Uh, Mark started teaching English in 1984. He's worked in Spain, Turkey, Brazil, and the UK. He has published many pronunciation books, including Pronunciation Games from CUP in 1995, one of my favorites. English Pronunciation in Use of uh, Intermediate, CUP 2012, and Prom Pack 1 to 4, uh, Hancock McDonald DLT 2017. He also publishes pronunciation materials on uh, HancockMcDonald.com and Prompac.com. So, over to you, Mark. Um, he hello, everybody. Um, can you see me yet? Um, yes. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, so, my talk is um, pronunciation teaching beyond listen and repeat. Uh, so I'd like to begin by looking at uh, what I mean by listen and repeat um, and then uh, talk about four different alternative approaches to pronunciation teaching, all of which have different strengths and weaknesses. And I'll give you examples of those act activities from those different types. Uh, okay, so let me first of all uh, find your slide. Right, so um, thank you, by the way, Brelt, for inviting me to join in this week. And um, I've watched all of the other talks this week, and it's a great event. And I hope that next year it's going to be a pronunciation year or <laughs> month at least. Okay, uh, here's a, a little dialogue in a classroom featuring listen and repeat. And I'll just uh, dramatize it for you. Uh, since I can't get a volunteer from the audience to join in, I'll have to be both parts myself. Well, I can help you. <laughs> can you? Okay, you can yeah. be um, you can be Javier. Okay. Esteem. Okay. So mm -hmm. write this down, please. What's the problem, Javier? No shit. Pardon? I haven't got a shit of paper. Oh, you mean sheet. It's pronounced sheet. Sheet. Yes, good. Everybody say after me, sheet. Sheet. Okay, so um, there's a, a little classroom dialogue um, featuring listen and repeat. Sometimes, um, let me just get out of screen share for a moment. Am I out of it? Yeah, sometimes a classroom pronunciation teaching is only ever listen and repeat like that. And there's just a, a few things. I mean, yes, you can't spend a long time on pronunciation all the time, but that particular dialogue had uh, some features which make it not particularly useful, in my opinion. First of all, there was no attention to meaning. Did, uh, did the student actually know the meaning of shit because if the student doesn't know there's a difference in meaning between shit and sheet uh, the power of the uh, the correction is, is lost that the student might just go oh well it sounds the same to me it doesn't matter it does matter it makes a big difference to the meaning and if the student doesn't know that lost opportunity um, something else that the teacher doesn't take the advantage of doing there is what Adrian Underhill called proprioception. The teacher doesn't give the student any insight into what difference is going on in their mouth in, as they pronounce those words. Um, so the student is not learning anything about how to make the difference. And uh, finally, the teacher does not hand over any control of this to the student. The students if you are teaching a group, it's always good to get the others in the group 
to comment uh, on how a student is doing in terms of making themselves intelligible or not, or making uh, pronouncing as intended. Um, so, so that they can decide what's adequate and what's not. Um, the teacher keeping control as if the teacher is the only person who can hear. So th that little uh, sequence, uh, albeit uh, invented, has some certain lacks, I think, in terms of pronunciation teaching. So I'm going to suggest uh, some different techniques to get around these problems. Let me go back to the slideshow here. Yes, uh, sorry, I, I'm not sure if I lost you for a second, Mark, or if it was just my connection. Okay, so um, where did you lose me? Um, I, I think it was just my connection. Okay, so um, hopefully you've got in front of you now a, a chart in hexagons. To me it looks normal. Okay. Okay, so thank you, Barbara. It was just my connection. And uh, this is a, a chart of vowel sounds. Um, Adrian Underhill was talking about the value and use of using a, a chart. Um, and I agree entirely with what he was saying. This is simply another version of a chart and you can do much the same kinds of things with it. Um, and this is my first example of what I would call a pronunciation workout. A pronunciation workout is specifically intended to get at the articulation or proprioception as Adrian was calling it. And uh, you can use a chart to uh, focus on the different vowel sounds in this case and how they, um, how, how to make them, what you have to do with your mouth to make those sounds. Um, let me go back to the camera um, for a moment, because I've got a chart behind me you may have seen. Hello? Uh, yeah. <coughs> so are, are you seeing are you seeing me on camera again? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So um, this chart behind me, um, in the corners of the hexagon, in the six corners, you've got uh, what I, I would call the long vowels. And uh, in in towards the centre from each corner, you've got a short equivalent vowel. Um, and then in the middle of each side, diphthongs and bang in the centre, you've got schwa. Um, just to make it a bit clearer, it might be better to, if I go back to the screen again. So um, let me draw how this works for you. You've got um, mm -hmm. long and short e, e, u, u, o, o, a, a, and e, e. Looks like a flower now, doesn't it? Oh, I forgot to put my uh, uh. So it's organized like that. Incidentally, the air, that to me is a long vowel, despite the fact that the symbol appears to be a diphthong. I would call that a long vowel. And uh, the reason I would call it that is that it can be extended indefinitely. That's a test. If the vowel can be extended indefinitely, it's a long vowel. So you've got e, u, uh, o, a, e. It can be extended indefinitely. Um, Alan Cruttenden, by the way, suggested that that sound should be called a long vowel and he uses a different symbol. I've kept the old symbol simply for dictionary currency. Um, so I mentioned then that uh, in the middle of each side you've got the uh, diphthongs there. Ow, I, 
and then in the center is the schwa the schwa um is a very exceptional one I, I wanted to put it in the center not because it's important but because it's different in kind from the others um here's a tip never in your classroom get into the business of trying to compare schwa with one of the other sounds the uh for example if, if you get into that your students are going to be confused because you're actually comparing two not comparable things never compare schwa with one of the other sounds um if you're interested in the schwa uh please type a question in to ask at the end about it because i don't want to get off my lesson plan by talking about it just too much now so anyway um let me get rid of all those markings you can do the same kind of workouts that adrian demonstrates so very well on his um, um videos from macmillan his sound foundation videos uh, where you go morphing from one sound to the other for example you can concentrate first on the long vowels and morph from one to the other like this um, you can ask your students to repeat after you e and then ooh, and then move from one to the other e and uh, ask them to do it again and this time focusing their mind their attention on what's going on inside their mouth as as they do this and um, you can do this trick where um, you put uh, the tip of a pencil on the end of your tongue and watch as the, the pencil go further into your mouth as you move from e to o that's a, a kind of a simple experiment to try and prove to the student that uh, either the tongue's going back or the lips are going forward. One way or another, the pencil goes further in. Uh, here's another example, moving from top to bottom. E A E A E A. In this case, um, you could ask your students to put their finger on their nose and their thumb on their chin and then then do it again e -a -e -a. and they will notice that their finger moves further apart from their chin when that happens and uh, what does that mean it means the mouth is opening more or to put it another way the jaw is going down so another simple little experiment. Um, you can have uh, lots of fun playing this um, chart as if it were some kind of instrument pointing at, at from sound to sound and getting the class to say those sounds or getting one of the students to point to the sounds and for their colleagues to say them uh, so that they can play the class like an orchestra if you're going to do that, um, bear in mind that you can't extend the short sounds, the ones in the inner circle, you can't extend those ones indefinitely like you can with the long ones. Um, because if you do, they lose the very quality that, that, that they have. They're no longer the same vowel sound. They are no more. So if you're going to, uh, for example, look at this one, the vowel sound in foot, you can't go Ooh, because it becomes the vowel sound in boot. So if you're going to do this one, you're going to have to make it short. So I would normally do this like this. And uh, you'll probably notice that uh, it sounds a bit like a monkey when I'm doing that one. Uh, that's another thing, good thing to do when you're presenting this chart or any chart in class is to uh, ask your students to think of a mnemonic, something that it reminds them of. Uh, so this one is a bit like the monkey. Um, the R ah might be the sound that you make when you have to open your mouth for the dentist. 
or it could be the sound you make when you see something really cute like a cat on YouTube and so on. You can get them to use their imagination and attach an image to each of these sounds to give them some kind of personality. Um, you can present uh, certain parts of the chart. You don't necessarily need to present it all in one go. And uh, I'm going to propose a subset here, which is this. Um, these are all outer circle sounds, look. Um, one diphthong and four long sounds. Diphthongs are long too, so they're all long really. And you'll notice that they've all got something in common. They've all got uh, a letter R in brackets. Why is that? Well, you'll notice that the example words given all have an R in the pronunciation. Sorry, not in the pronunciation, in the spelling. The, the pronunciation it may or may not have that R. It's optional. In my pronunciation, you've got ear, bird, fork, arm, hair. Um, in Tiago's pronunciation, if you went to his talk just before mine, he was saying something more like this. Or maybe you could say them, Tiago. Are you there? Yes, I'm here. Go ahead and say those words, please. Bird, fork, arm, hair, and ear. OK, thank you. So you see that uh, Thiago is pronouncing those letter R um, in a way which sounds to me uh, quite American. Um, the way I said them was clearly uh, British English sort of manner, where um, the, the only trace of the R left is in the lengthening of the vowel. In other words, the R always affects the vowel that comes before it. So if I'm using this chart uh, for American pronunciation, you would say those are all R colored vowels and the R is pronounced. In England, in English, English, the, the R is, disappears altogether and all that remains is the long vowel, but there is this special relationship between the R and the vowel. Now, uh, I would like to be completely ambivalent about which way my students pronounce it. I pronounce uh, bird like that, bird. If my students say bird, that's absolutely fine. And uh, I, uh, most of them do, in fact, despite the fact that uh, they're here in a part of England where we don't pronounce that R, they usually maintain it because they, they see it there in the spelling and they want to say it. That's fine. Um, the R is very variable. If you take a Scottish accent, it has a, another pronunciation altogether, neither American nor the, the English way. Um, OK, so uh, I would like to focus on just these five sounds for another kind of pronunciation workout. Um, this workout really focuses on the spelling to sound correspondence. So um, repeat after me, column one. Ear. Beer. Ear. Beer. Yes, yeah, um, I'm drinking <laughs> my erotic accent. <laughs> Uh, don't yeah. me because uh, there's a little bit of a delay on the line, so it might not be very fast. Every, everybody who's listening, please listen. Uh, repeat after me in your inner ear, in your mind, um, or aloud if you if you like. Um, ear, beer, dear, fear, feared, peer, here. I would do that with the students first. Then I would ask them. Uh, to look at those words in that column and uh, identify any patterns in the spelling. Um, guess what? The most common one appears to be E-A for that sound. E-A-R, don't forget the R is actually part of the spelling. The double E-R is another possibility. You also have exotic ones. Peer, that's a, a rare kind of spelling. 
here you just get that in a few common words, but uh, not, it's not so common generally. So you can get the students to uh, observe spelling patterns because um, it's also important. Most students uh, will be coming to English knowing how it looks written in this day and age. So you can't ignore the, uh, the way it looks in spelling. It's best to get to grips with it. Don't just pretend you can get away with not referring to the spelling at all. Let's just try that with another column. Column two, repeat after me. Burn, bird, dirty, first, firm, purse, word. Uh, let's have a look at the spelling patterns here. You'll notice that uh, we've got E-A-R again. So there is a potential for confusion with the E-A-R of the other one. That's worth noting. Um, the I-R is a quite a common one, look. Then you've got the U-R is a bit rarer. And then you've got uh, W-O-R. The W has a, often has a strange effect on the vowel that follows it. Um, matter of fact, you can see that effect in the following column, column three. Let's just do that. Um, we've got or, board, door, for, form, port, warm. You can see that in this column, the spelling is relatively regular. You've got uh, O-R is common now, double O-R in, in one case, O-U-R. But the W-A-R, that's a rather unusual one. And uh, again, I, I say it's because of the W at the beginning. So there's a, the, the spelling rule is not easy to express, but uh, you, can, you can at least observe that the W tends to have an effect on the, uh, a vowel that follows it. The next column, column four, I won't read those out, but you can see that the spelling there is very regular. And then in column five, that's tricky. Air, bear, dare, fair, fair, pair, where. There you can see that there's a lot of different spelling patterns and you can predict that there will be problems here. Take for example, pair. Uh, I bet you have students that say peer. I certainly do. Um, so it, you can see why that would be, can't you? Look, if it's uh, got the same spelling pattern as ear, peer, it seems logical. So that's one to watch, look out for. Uh, and then students uh, sometimes look at these two and they go, teacher, I can't hear the difference between those two. And uh, you just say, well, there is no difference. They're pronounced exactly the same. Uh, strangely mind-blowing concept. I, <laughs> I find the students, uh, they, as if they've never thought of it possible, that it could be possible to have two different spellings for the same pronunciation. But there you go. It needs to be, you need to pay attention to spelling, I think. Uh, incidentally, whilst we're on the topic, Every speaker, I think, in the Brelt Pronunciation Week has pointed out that there is no such thing as correct and incorrect. There is simply, it works or it doesn't work. It's intelligible or it isn't intelligible. I agree with that, except in the case of spelling to sound correspondence. Um, for example, if your student says peer for pair, that's an example of an error because the student is not saying it because they can't say the other. They're saying it because they're misreading the, uh, the, from the spelling. It's a, a spelling induced error. So whilst I agree with everybody else in the, in, in the pronunciation week who said error is not an uh, appropriate concept, in this one case, in the case of spelling, I think we can talk about error. Um, okay, 
I'll just, um, that was category one of the pronunciation exercise types I wanted to talk about pronunciation workouts. And um, it has this category of activity has its strengths, particularly in terms of uh, articulation and getting students to actually produce uh, the difference between different sounds. The next category is pronunciation puzzles. This type of activity has a different purpose and a different, different virtues altogether. The example you can see here is working on stress in two syllable nouns. You can go through the puzzle starting at the top left, emerging at the bottom right there. And uh, you go through if the word contained in the in the room has the pronunciation with the stress on the first syllable, dada, like that, dada, dada. Stress on the first syllable, not on the second. So the first word there is melon, melon. Notice, by the way, a lot of the words in this particular exercise um, are probably cognates in the student's own language. And sometimes the cognate would have the stress in a different place. Um, for example, melon, melon. I think it's, uh, it would be in Portuguese, right? Melon. That has a different stress pattern from the English version. So the exercise is supposed to uh, <coughs> draw students' attention to that difference. So yeah, um, they enter that way. Then they've got two choices. You can go to alarm or salad. One of them is not possible because it doesn't have the stress on the first syllable. Alarm. Alarm has the stress on the second syllable. Salad, stress on the first, so we can go that way. Okay, so um, can you uh, try going through there? I'll give you um, half a minute. Now I'm bored already, let's carry on. We're going to go uh, this way to coffee, to lemon, to menu, to design. Design, no, we can't go there. Design has a stress on the second syllable. Let's go to artist, color, actor, concert, college, minute, tourist, sofa, out, end of game. Um, <clears throat> we're, we're talking about stress here in two syllable nouns and uh, here's a little rule if you're interested. Um, apparently 90% of nouns which of two syllables have the stress on the first and the same goes for adjectives. So there's an interesting little factoid. Um, Verbs, on the other hand, have the opposite tendency. They tend to have the stress on the second syllable. Take, for example, if you think of design not as a noun, but as a verb, then design, that's typical. Um, whilst we're on the topic of stress, uh, let's just have a look at, for a minute at a word like um, actor. Actor has stress on the first syllable. Um, the second syllable is unstressed, and it's in my in my accent, it's simply a schwa. Actor. In an American accent, it would be an a, a schwa with an r colouring at the end. Actor. Um, in many students' accents, they prefer to keep 
the full value of the O. So they say things like actor. And uh, that to me is not a problem. Uh, they don't use the schwa, um, so what? As long as they're not uh, stressing the second part, you can unstress without using a schwa. That is possible and feasible and uh, it probably more common in global uh, English as a lingua franca. So actor or actor, whatever version they have, as long as the stress is on that first one. Okay, um, so that's an example of a pronunciation puzzle. You'll notice that with a pronunciation puzzle like this, the students can actually do it in silence. So in what sense is that practicing their pronunciation? Well, two points. First of all, the intention here is really about awareness raising, um, awareness to uh, the stress in this case and uh, how it might differ from their L1, in especially, especially if they've got cognates in there. And secondly, students always sub-vocalize. If you watch them doing this activity, you hear them saying the word to themselves or if they're working in pairs to their partner. They're actually, they do say them aloud. So they are getting some productive practice. And then when you go through the answers, you can uh, get uh, more productive practice in. So although the focus isn't on productive practice, practice but rather um, awareness raising, it does, they do actually try saying these words whilst they do it. So pronunciation puzzles. Um, the next activity category uh, that I'm using here is pair works. Um, <clears throat> classic activity in pronunciation is the minimal pair. Let me um, go back into camera view. Okay, hopefully I'm back on camera view with you. Um, Jago, can, can you see me on camera view now? Yes. Yes. Okay. So um, let me hold up two words here. Prices and prizes. Prices and prizes. Okay. I'm going to say one of these two words. And uh, all you have to do is look at the word I'm saying. And uh, using um, eye tracking technology, we will see which one you've got. Okay, <laughs> here goes. Prizes. Prizes. Which one did you choose? Well, uh, let me see. According to the technology, you chose this one. <laughs> prizes. Um, this one was prices. Prices. What's the difference? Well, the difference is that uh, this one has there's two differences, actually. Two differences. This one has a s sound, a consonant s, s, and this one has Z, z, z consonant sound. That's the first difference. We have a uh, difference. We have unvoiced and voiced consonants. Um, here's an experiment for telling the difference between voiced and unvoiced. Um, putting your hand on your voice box as you say it. Do that and then say like a snake, right? And now do that and say the uh, mosquito sound. I can feel a little bit of vibration in here. So that's one version of the experiment. Another one is you can do the same with the hand on the top of your head and you'll find the same. But the uh, third variant on this activity is the most mind-blowing one. It's putting your fingers in your ears like this. 
and you go no problem then go and uh, your mind seems to explode uh, i hope you've just tried that now okay so that was the first difference between voiced and uh, voiced and unvoiced the second difference is in the vowel sound before those consonants um, listen to the vowel sound prices prizes prices prizes I'm wondering if you've noticed that the vowel sound is shortened slightly before the unvoiced consonant. It's called vowel sound clipping. Um, in fact, you've got two clues as to which word I'm saying. You've got the voicing of the consonant or the clipping of the vowel. Two, two routes to find which one you're listening to. Um, according to some research, search I read by Anne Cutler, uh, native speakers of English, so-called, tend to use the vowel clipping more than the voicing, um, whereas non-native speakers of English tend to use the voicing more both ways, as long as you reach the, uh, the desired conclusion, it doesn't matter. Let me go back to the slide. So that's a minimal pair activity. Here, the first pair, sip and zip. You could simply ask your students to point if this is projected at the front of your room or written on a blackboard with the sip on the left and zip on the right. You could simply ask your students to point to the one they hear and you, then you say sip and if they're all pointing to the one on the left you know that they're all hearing you as you intended to be heard then you've got racer and razor here you see the, the the two sounds in the middle of a word and uh, finally you've got price and prize with the two sounds at the end those two at the end are kind of the most difficult because the voicing difference is least audible when the sound is at the end. Price, prize, because there's no vowel sound after it to, as it were, lubricate that consonant sound. So, and there's a tendency uh, among many speakers to devoice a consonant at the end of a word anyway. <clears throat> so, uh, when the sound is at the end of a word, then that's when uh, the vowel clipping feature really comes into its own to help you out. Price sounds shorter than prize. Um, here's a minimal pair activity. Cubed. Instead of simply having two options, you've got four because there are two, two pairs of words, well, a pair of word in each option. So you've got the prize of peace, the prize of peas, the price of peas, and the price of peace. <clears throat> so that's uh, actually fiendishly difficult. Um, you say one, the students say the letter or the students say one and the class say the letter, or the students say one and their partner says the letter. Um, if they find it difficult, then at, uh, at the very least they've discovered that uh, they need to be careful with these two sounds, especially at the end of a word, uh, because m there may be misunderstandings. And they may try strategies to try and make it more audible. For example, exaggerating the voicing or exaggerating the vowel clipping. So for example, the prize of peace, exaggerating the length of prize and uh, exaggerating the shortness of peace. That would be a strategy to try and get their partner to 
understand the one that they intend. Okay. <clears throat> My last activity category. Um, oh, I haven't really got, yeah. No, I, I will move on to the last one because I do want to have time for questions. Yeah. So the, la the last category of activity is poems, by which I mean songs, raps, anything with a lyric. Um, and here's an example. It's focusing again on the difference between uh, I and E. I'll just get some background music going. And uh, I'll show you how it goes. Excuse me a minute, I'm just getting my, back, my music. You won't get fit just sitting on a seat. If you want to get fit, got to get up on your feet. Don't fill that seat, got to move a little bit. Kick your feet to the beat, feel the heat, that's it. You won't get fit just sitting on a seat. If you want to get fit, got to get up on your feet. Don't fill that seat, got to move a little bit. Kick your feet to the beat, feel the heat, that's it. Uh, next time I'll do it again and you can repeat along with me. Or say along with me. You won't get fit just sitting on a seat. If you want to get fit, got to get up on your feet. Don't fill that seat, got to move a little bit. Get your feet to the beat, feel the heat, that's it. You won't get fit just sitting on a seat. If you want to get fit, got to get up on your feet. Don't fill that seat, got to move a little bit. Get your feet to the beat, feel the heat, that's it. Thank you. Well done. Um, what I would do with this is uh, do two lines at a time and get the students to repeat those two lines. So um, let's do that. You repeat two lines, I say two lines and then you repeat those two lines. <laughs> You won't get fit just sitting on a seat. If you want to get fit, got to get up on your feet. If you want to get fit, got to get up on your feet. Don't fill that seat, got to move a little bit. Kick your feet to the beat, feel the heat, that's it. Um, another thing you can do uh, is focus on smaller than chunks, smaller chunks than whole whole lines. For example, how about that? So for example, repeat after me. Just sitting on a sitting on a sitting on a seat. Just sitting on a sitting on a sitting on a seat. Just sitting on a sitting on a sitting on a seat. Just sitting on a 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 seat. That kind of thing. Um, I find the, the effect of micro repetitions like that really draws the students' attention to the way it sounds because students uh, often hear what their mind expects to hear. They don't hear objectively what, what the thing sounds like. Uh, micro repetitions or micro drilling, as I would call it, really draws attention to the strangeness of uh, the connected sound, uh, the sound substance, as Richard Caldwell calls it. Um, so if you wanna, if you wanna, if you wanna, if, if you wanna, if you wanna get fit, wanna get fit, wanna get fit, got to get up on your get up on your get up on get up on your get up on your get up on your feet, got to get up on your feet, got to get up on your get up on your get up on your feet. Takes a bit of practice to be honest. <laughs> but it's uh um a uh, technique which uh, I've been working on the last year or so called micro drilling and I've uh, put an article about it in English Teaching Professional and um, it'll be out next month. Um, and 
the value of uh, pronunciation, raps, chants, songs, etc., is that uh, they they really draw attention to the target features. In this case, uh, e and i, because there's such a lot of them together in a short space, in a, in a striking, um, memorable sort of context. As a matter of fact, if you do this activity near the end of your class, your students are likely to be walking home um, with it going round in their head like this. You won't get fit just sitting on a seat. If you want to get fit, you've got to get up on your feet. So they're doing extra um, free practice uh, outside class, which is nice. Um, they might come back next class and when they see you, they start saying this, saying the poem out to you again. Um, it's uh, quite a memorable thing, a poem, for some reason. So uh, it really highlights and makes salient, makes noticeable certain features of pronunciation that you want to focus on. Um, okay. So I've suggested then that there are four different types of activity. You've got pronunciation workouts, especially good for noticing and articulating. Puzzles, which are good for awareness raising. Pair works, good for communicating. And poems, good for noticing and articulating again. Um, down, down there at the bottom, by the way, you've got two uh, websites. This particular set of slides, if you'd like to download these slides to use any of them in your class, uh, you can download them from Hancock MacDonald, which is this website, hancockmacdonald.com. And uh, if you look on the home page, currently this particular webinar is there. There is a, a short article um, summarizing what I've just been talking about. There are downloads of the, the rap backing track and, um, and the slides. And uh, once this webinar is finished, I'll put a link to the YouTube as well, right there. So that's Hancock MacDonald. Um, the other website is Pronpack, uh, which is uh, connected to the latest books I've published called Pronpack 1, 2, 3, and 4, which you can see there at the bottom. Now, if you go to this website, go to resources, and down in resources, you have to uh, you have to get an account with the website, but it's uh, free. And there you can download um, the pronunciation chart, which I was um, working with earlier on, um, in high resolution, in various versions, including the British and the American version, and uh, a phonics version. So three versions, and then each of those with images, if you prefer, rather than guide words. So those can be downloaded there under resources. Um, yeah, those are the books I was talking about. Um, if anybody's going to Ayatafel, please find me at Stand 34 with the Independent Authors and Publishers Group with Dorothy Zimach and um, Rob Howard. There are some references. If anybody's looking for references, um, you can look at this on YouTube later and pause on this slide to see them. And that's uh, the end. So I'll be hoping for some questions for you, from you, yeah, please. <laughs> All right, Mark, thank you very much for such an enlightening session. That was really amazing. Uh, we have lots of compliments for you and your group. People saying that it was very enlightening, you really enjoyed it. A lot of compliments on the wrapping. Yes, uh, and before, yeah. bef be sorry, Barbara, you're, you're uh, your voice sounds a little robotic, so maybe it's the, the internet connection. Mark, I have bad news for you. Oh, no. Yes, I have very bad news for you. 
Uh, you cannot come to Brazil anymore. Why so? Be because there are many people here in the comments saying that they're in love. So I think it's not going to be good for your marriage for you to come to Brazil because uh, of course we knew your work and everything, but after this presentation, everyone is in love. It was awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Can you listen to me now? I can. Can you, Mark? Yeah, you do sound a bit robotic, like Tiago said. Um, but uh, it's okay as long as we can understand. Have you got any? I'm going to try and give you the first question and you tell me if it's good, right? You seem to be in a very dark place. It might be my internet connection. All right, so the first question is any tips to work on connected speech on a regular basis? Andrea Common is asking and saying that she thinks it's nice to work on, on connected speech with students from very first classes and very first levels. And she's asking what your opinion is on that. I think it's a good idea, um, especially for listening purposes. As Igor Kavalkansh was saying, um, was it Tuesday? He said uh, the importance of pronunciation for listening. And uh, he was talking about Richard Caldwell's work. I think that's uh, exactly exactly right. I always uh, like to work on connected speech. And it's uh, importantly, um, it's, it's, it's for listening because the students may or may not take, uh, may or may not pronounce it that way themselves. As a matter of fact, according to Jennifer Jenkins, as Thiago said before, uh, uh, it may make them less intelligible the more that they compress their speech down into connected speech. But for listening, it's very important. So uh, things like that, what I was talking about with that rap before the uh, micro drilling, uh, that micro drilling, taking small chunks out of the rap, sitting on a sitting on a sitting on a sitting on a seat, that kind of um, micro drilling, you can do that with any piece of sentence. You know, maybe you're working on something in the course book and there's a sentence there uh, in the grammar exercise. You can uh, micro drill that sentence in just the same way with lots of repetition of a very short stretch. You can do that with any piece of text and it's a good idea. You can get students to observe the way that the sounds blend together, the consonant links to the following vowel, uh, the M assimilates to an N before a certain sound or whatever. All of these features, without necessarily being so analytical about it, you can point those things out and uh, raise their awareness, particularly for um, the receptive skill. All right. Thank you very much. Um, I have a question myself. Do you think all of these activities are suitable for all ages? Sometimes I feel that adults might uh, feel a little resistant about Mazes or, or something like that. What do you think from your experience? Yeah, I, I thought there's something that Claire Venable said, which was interesting. On um, I think it was Tuesday, she talked about uh, an analytic linguistic approach versus uh, intuitive imitative approach, um, and she said that the the latter, the intuitive imitative approach, was more suitable for young learners. Uh, so they, rather than say looking at um, minimal pairs, they might just be doing more of these uh, champs and raps and things. And I think I, I, that's probably true. Uh, I don't personally teach very young learners myself, um, but I think it's probably true that uh, some a lot of the material that I, I use and I, that you'll find in my books would be more for the more of the analytical. Um, linguistic approach that uh, Claire talked about, and uh, you know, not all of them would be ideal for the young learners. At the other end of the spectrum, you, you might be thinking that uh, adults uh, will never demean themselves to uh, rapping in class, and uh, my experience is not the case. It is not the case that they don't mind. Um, it's the teachers that have a problem with it, usually. The students uh, don't have a problem with it. Um, 
one way you can try it out if you're not confident about that is to um, introduce it uh, gradually like a Trojan horse. You can just say the text as if it were um, uh, prose and then gradually make it more rhythmic or more musical. For example, you won't get fit just sitting on a seat. You won't get fit just sitting on a seat. If you want to get fit, got to get up on your feet. And then as you say it again and again, gradually uh, introduce the rhythmic aspects so that it becomes recognizably a rap. If you find that the student is not appreciating that gradual movement towards the more musical version, then you don't have to go there. You can go as far as you think you can um, get. But uh, do try it because it's very valuable for pronunciation practice. We will, I'm sure we will. We're all in love with very Thank you very much. Any more questions? I don't think we have any more questions for now. So, um, Mark, thank you very much for this. As I said, it's wonderful. It was wonderful, and, and everyone loved it. And uh, you have even more fans in Brazil after that. And uh, thank you, everyone, who's been a part of uh, our first pronunciation week. It, uh, it, was, it, w it was incredible. I have no words, really. So thank you, uh, the Braille community. Thank you. Uh, people from, from other parts of the world who just got to, to, to know us now. And uh, thank you to my fellow moderators, uh, Barbara Fortado, Bruno Andrade, uh, Fernando Machado, Priscila Bordon, and uh, Eduardo de Freitas, who was uh, the person who, who did a lot of work to put all this together. So thank you, Edu. This wouldn't have been possible without you. And we really appreciate all the hard work you put into this. And thank you to the speakers. And uh, I hope that we do this again next year, right? Yes, Barbara, the certificates. Really sorry to interrupt you. Just because we have one last minute question here from Andrea, too. And I awesome. want to take advantage out of the fact Mark's still there. Um, She's asking, do you introduce the chart little by little based on errors that emerge, or do you do it uh, as planning part of your lesson? Uh, sorry, I, I didn't catch that. Could you um, repeat it back? Or... Yes, she's asking, do you introduce the chart, the chart you show to us, little by little, based on errors that emerge, or is this part of your lesson like presenting the chart and, and working with the students? I think um, you've got both things going on. You, 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 you can introduce the chart uh, in, a, in a lesson specifically devoted to pronunciation. Um, what I normally do is I, I present the six corners of this, um, the six corners, the long vowels, and uh, I often just te work on those on the first day, the first time I present it. I work on the six corners. I, I like to do that because they're infinitely extendable. So the student gets plenty of um, audible input. You can go e, and you can extend that as long as you like. So that makes it um, very pleasing or easy to work on to begin with. And uh, you can go right round the, the circuit like this. You can play great games with it, which uh, students, I find, they rather enjoy. Uh, so having done that, uh, on a later occasion, you might then do the inner circle sounds and compare them to the outer circle sounds. You've got the long, short contrast going on there. And then on another, another lesson, you might introduce the sounds which are the letters of the alphabet, so A, E, I, O, U, A, E, I, O, U. That might be another group you could focus on. Um, so yes, I, I tend to teach them in groups like that. Um, and then the other point you were asking about correction, 
having got the students part familiar with it, then you can point to this when you're giving any particular, uh, you're saying correction, uh, when you're talking about pronunciation for whatever reason, if, if the student is saying something which is not intelligible, you might use the chart to talk about how they might change what they're saying to be, become more intelligible. So yes, a bit of both, a bit of presenting it in a, in a devoted section of a lesson devoted to pronunciation and, and later afterwards using it every time that you come to talk about problems with a pronunciation feature. So both things, I would use it both ways. All right, thank you very much, Dr. Okay, so if we don't have uh, any other questions, uh, just people uh, saying thanks. Well, so once again, thank you all for making this possible. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, all the other speakers. And hopefully we'll see you again next year because uh, I think this event has to be in our, in our annual calendar. Uh, let us know that. what you think. So bye-bye, and we hope that you have a, a lovely um, weekend, rest of the weekend. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. <laughs>